Hello, my name is Emmanuel Mignot and I'm a professor at Stanford University and I have the pleasure to talk to you about uh, the sleep analytics revolution. So why do we need to use sleep analytics? First, because of course a lot of patients have sleep problems and these sleep problems are extremely frequent. Second, we are doing millions of PSG uh, every year and from this PSG we really only um, uh, we only extract very, very basic summary data, such as the number of apnea hypopnea index, number of periodic leg movements, number of arousals, and various sleep stages. And as you will discover, it's clearer and clearer that the signals are much more complex and contain a lot of incipient information on brain and cardiovascular health that's really not extracted from these simple summaries. So this is what I'm talking about. You are all familiar with PSG. Uh, it's uh, a, an ensemble of signals that really does not only measure uh, brain waves, but also uh, heart rate, breathing, um, and leg movements, as well as muscle tone. And yet, as I mentioned, we really only uh, have very basic statistics that we report for, from all these data that's recorded for eight hours. Uh, when the patient is really captive to uh, moni physiological monitoring. So analysis of this kind of data has really made a leap forward with the introduction of deep learning techniques. And the first one that was really created was called CNN, or Convolutional Neural Network. It's basically a very simple idea of a neural network where uh, an image, for example, because that has mostly been used to um, uh, do face recognition or speech recognition, uh, an image will be going through this very complex set of filters. And it will really go, go and say yes and no and yes and no. And at the end, on the other side, a human is going to look at the picture and, for example, say this is my picture or it's a picture of someone else. And after a while, uh, if a lot of pictures are presented, the network is going to learn all the possible trajectory and nodes that are going to recognize my face versus the face of others. And if you present a new picture, it's going to automatically find if it's my face or not. This is called supervised machine learning because it's supervised by human annotation. Um, this works very well for image recognition, but more recently, uh, a, a slightly different variant has been added, which is called recurrent networks, which add a, a temporal uh, uh, dimension to uh, CNNs. In this type of network, not only is the decision to um, the, each of the node is yes and no for the presence of a certain characteristic, but also the yes or no will depend of what has been seen before. So for example, if we had a video, obviously if my face had been recognized uh, before, it's much more likely that my face will still be in the frame just after. So this keeps that in memory to make the decision for the next uh, frame. So of course, this is very helpful for sleep studies. And as you see here, uh, this has been used first for sleep stages, where basically you can extract different features. You know, so basically you can do a spectral analysis, or you can do all kinds of different autocorrelations. There are many different ways you can really analyze this data. And then it really created this, creates this kind of pictures, which of course are moving because there's a temporal relationship. And uh, these are annotated, the so same way as a face is annotated. Here it's annotated as stage one, stage two, stage three, etc. And little by little, uh, the network is going to learn uh, to recognize e each of the sleep stage. It's very important in this case to set aside some data and then have the network always uh, re come back to new data uh, to avoid that, that, uh, that the network overfits and recognize every image. Uh, so there is certain techniques uh, that, that avoid that, uh, avoid the concept of overfitting. And you see here on the bottom that really um, the F1 score, which is a, the percent of agreement of the machine learning uh, versus uh, a score, you see is going to go to improve and at some point it's leveling off after about a several hundred PSG and basically the network has learned to recognize every sleep, sleep stage quite well. And this is uh, what we are doing, for example, with somnomedics right now, or, but 
who has adopt, adopted some of our um, uh, programs and improves them in the context of their own hardware. And you see here that as we have obtained with our own uh, neural network, we can uh, clearly see that uh, when you compare a technician versus a machine learning model, um, and you see that uh, F1 score is about 87%, uh, which means that in general, uh, the machine learning will uh, agree 87% with, with uh, consensus of score versus a technician versus a consensus of snorer of, of scorers is, is only agreeing about 80%. So uh, this way we can show that really not only um, the deep learning can uh, score accurately, but it can do better than a single score because in fact it is closer, the prediction is closer to the, that of the consensus of multiple scores. And this uh, works quite well. And of course, not only you can use that for doing all kind of other annotation, for example, you can uh, you know, score sleep apnea or score other events or leg movements, etc., the exact same way. Uh, but uh, I want to point out that um, doing this kind of supervised machine learning is not uh, brainless. It, in fact, gives you more information than just uh, a sleep stage. It gives you the probability of each sleep stage. And that's what we call here our hypnodensity plot. Uh, he, here you see on the top uh, a normal hypnogram, uh, but instead of being represented as, you know, wake, etc., the white is the probability of wake, the red is the probability of stage one, the, the light blue is probability of stage two, the dark blue is probability of stage three, and then dark uh, black is the probability of REM. And as you see here in the typical hypnogram of a normal person, at the beginning, the subject is awake for almost two hours here, but he has like very brief kind of naps, maybe where it goes into uh, stage one and even a little bit stage one, but it never reaches above a 50% probability. So really, uh, you, maybe you have a little sleep onset here, but really generally it will, it will not meet uh, uh, sufficient time to be awake. And then around this here, he has a couple of naps and then he finally goes into stage one and then stage two and that's a real sleep onset. And then later on, he goes to stage three. And then here you see that he has his first REM period, but uh, that reach about 50% probability, uh, you know, and, and uh, so uh, here, and then goes back into stage two and so forth. And that's a normal sleep cycle. Uh, what's remarkable here is that you don't just get stage one, stage two, etc. You get the confidence of each sleep stage. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, these probability distributions are very close to what you get if you were getting multiple scores scoring the same uh, sleep recording. And we realized quite quickly that when we try to use this program in insomnia, sleep apnea, PLMs, they were doing very well. But for narcolepsy, somehow there were a lot of disagreement between human scores and uh, the automatic scoring. And the reason was depicted below is there were some period of time where really the machine learning had trouble distinguishing REM sleep from stage one or wake or stage two, as you see here or here. And what is really type one narcolepsy, if not exactly that? Uh, patients with narcolepsy are often paralyzed, but awake, or they may have dreaming, but they are half, uh, you know, conscious. So really they have these dissociated REM sleep stages where REM sleep is not pure, it's mixed with wakefulness. And that's exactly what the computer, uh, you know, could detect. So this gave us the idea of deriving some from the probability distribution that's abnormal in narcolepsy, some other features that then are used into a lasso and other statistical model to try to diagnose narcolepsy. And as you see here now, uh, we can really use the automatic analysis of a single night of sleep to diagnose narcolepsy with a rock curve, which is a reflection of specificity sensitivity, almost as good as the MSLT or similar to the MSLT. Uh, this was published in, in uh, uh, Nature uh, Communication. And I'm hoping that uh, some nomadics and other um, companies will really set up this uh, uh, method as well in their um, in, in the automatic scoring programs. We also have developed uh, uh, methods to uh, score arousals. 
And the way we have done it is we have not only used supervised machine learning where our results were actually scored by technician and try to predict them, but also we used uh, uh, a second uh, method where we, we also try to predict very, very small events of weak uh, and we merge the probability and this is also going quite well uh, because we get uh, an F1 kind of a correspondence with a score of about 0.76, which is similar between two scores or even better to, to most individual scores. So I'm not going to go in detail, but not all those things have been implemented by um, hardware manufacturers, but I think it's a future. And our uh, you know, PSG analyzer is already able to really do this uh, sleep stage identification very well, better than humans. It can also detect uh, arousals uh, very well. And, and we are also working on detecting autonomic arousals. It can detect periodic leg movements with or without arousals and uh, breathing abnormality, including subtypes of sleep apnea. Also, I must admit that sleep apnea was one of the hardest to crack, and mostly because two technicians often disagree quite a bit about the scoring of sleep apnea, so the gold standard is not very good. We are also applying this uh, sleep dissociation phenomenon to diagnose narcolepsy and REM behavior disorder, and we know that it's generalizable across different hardware and populations. And we're actually trying to now collect 220,000 PSGs. And uh, of course, uh, working with some somnomedics is very helpful because um, uh, when you try to optimize a program, if you use the same hardware, you're going to be able to have more accuracy than if you were using uh, different hardware because you can have the computer learn the specificities of the signal uh, that's more reproducible with the same hardware. And we're now working to integrate this in a single detector. But what I wanted to also finish with is that uh, doing this automatic sleep scoring is really the first step. Um, yes, we can do automatic scoring probably better than human technicians. And the way we can prove it is by having multiple technicians score the same recording and showing that on average, the deep learning is doing better than a single technician in comparison to the the, um, uh, the consensus of all the technicians, but uh, there are also other information. For example, in this analysis, we have done uh, use deep learning to try to predict age of people based on their PSG. And to make a long story short, we actually were able to find that some people have a sleep that predict an older age than their real age. And then sometimes people have a sleep of a younger person than their real age. And what we could show is that if people have a younger age of sleep versus the actual age, they have a better prognosis than if people have an older age. And um, uh, that does predict mortality. Uh, this was done in population-based studies in about 9,000 people with 3,000 deaths. And uh, now we actually uh, using deep learning to directly predict uh, deaths. And there is actually new methods that uh, not only can uh, do survival analysis uh, using deep learning, but also even show the portions of the signal that is mostly predicting mortality. So uh, we, we are very excited about this because maybe not only we'll be able to do a regular scoring of all sleep events, but also we might be able to detect some new um, uh, features inside sleep that predict mortality or cardiovascular event or dementia using this new technology. So in conclusion, I think it's fair to say that deep learning will largely replace human scoring, but it's important to know that it has limitation. It can't recognize some things that it has never seen. For example, if you have seizures and you haven't taught the deep learning programs that these are seizures, it's going to say, oh, it looks like slow wave and it's going to do its best to classify it in the categories that you have uh, told him to, to assign. Uh, of course, it may, uh, you may have a confidence and you could flag these events as not being, being atypical, but still, uh, it's important to understand this limitation. One of the very good things is it's repeatable. So once you have, it has learned it, uh, you can run the sleep studies through the same um, uh, software and it will give you exactly the same result, whereas of course a technician scoring twice the same study would not. 
It has also the potential of revealing entering new phenomena. I gave you the example of narcolepsy, probably it can diagnose REM behavior disorder. We may find feature of sleepwalking, again, dementia, etc. And I think uh, for me, it will really meet its full potential only when we are able to measure multiple sleeps nights at home and, and uh, be able to record not only sleep, but also wake. And I think uh, in the future, uh, sleep will not be used just to diagnose sleep disorders, but also potentially to be give us a window to cardiovascular and brain health and potentially at home. I hope this was a stimulating presentation and I, I uh, don't hesitate to, to reach me at minio at stanford.edu. Thank you for your attention. Etwa 30 Prozent der Bevölkerung leiden unter Insomnie. Sicherlich kommt Ihnen dieses Szenario bekannt vor. Patienten klagen über Müdigkeit, Konzentrationsschwierigkeiten und Gereiztheit. Die Ursache dafür können neurologisch bedingte Schlafstörungen sein, für die es bisher kein effizientes Screeningverfahren zur Erfassung objektiver Daten gab. Somnomedics hat die Lösung. Der 30 Gramm leichte Home Sleep Test, kurz HST, ist ein kostengünstiger Screener zur Messung von Schlafparametern und das von zu Hause aus. Eine App leitet Patienten in wenigen Schritten durch die einfache Applikation bis zum Start der Messung. Per Bluetooth sendet der HST nun Daten an das Tablet. In der Nacht zeichnet er drei frontopolare EEG, zwei EOG, EMG, Licht, Aktivität und Kopflage auf. Das Tablet nimmt Schnarchgeräusche auf. Durch kontinuierliche Impedanzkontrolle wird die Qualität der Signale geprüft. Nach der Messung werden die Daten automatisch in die geschützte Somnomedics Cloud hochgeladen. So kann flexibel darauf zugegriffen werden. Die Rohdaten können automatisch, semiautomatisch oder manuell ausgewertet werden und geben Aufschluss über alle Kernparameter der Insomnie-Diagnostik. Bei minimalem Aufwand entsteht so eine vollwertige, standardkonforme Schlafstadienanalyse. Zur Erfassung der Variabilität können auch kurzfristig Mehrfachmessungen vorgenommen werden. Im Vergleich mit dem Goldstandard Polysomnographie ergibt sich eine Übereinstimmung von 85 Prozent. Die ambulante Untersuchung mit dem HST kann also zuverlässig mithalten und die subjektiven Empfindungen der Patienten objektiv untermauern. Die einfache Anwendung des HST ermöglicht den breiten Einsatz als Screening-Tool bei vielen Patienten. Und das bei kalkulierbaren, geringen Investitionskosten. Der Homesleep-Test – der einfachste Weg zum objektiven Schlafprofil. Einfach, zuverlässig, effizient.